Thank you, Roman. Um, can I confirm that you can hear me, first of all? Yes, we can hear you, Roman. Excellent. That's good, because I, I had some echo earlier, so I had to mute my line. Um, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you very much for, for joining us today. I'm uh, des delighted to be um, providing this presentation to you all. And um, as Roman has said, I look forward to your questions. Please do submit them as we go through, and I will um, do what I can to answer them later. Um, Roman has done a, a fantastic job of introducing myself and has uh, said everything that I was going to say already. Uh, but I think the, the, the key thing to pick out is that um, through my experience, my 20 years of, of working in this area, um, really focusing on working with enterprises to both understand, comply with, and get best value out of legislation. Um, and what, I, uh, what I've used in the work that we're going to talk about today is that experience to uh, provide the ins insight into policy development and implementation across Europe. So um, let's have a quick look at um, during what I'm going to talk about during today's webinar. So first and foremost, I will uh, introduce you to Ricardo Energy and Environment, and I will also introduce you to the Energy Efficiency Directive Article 8. Um, there'll be very quick introductions. Don't get too worried. Um, we'll then focus on looking at the, the scope of the study that we're talking around, the study on energy efficiency and enterprises uh, for the European Commission, and uh, then dig into some of the detail around the challenges that that uh, study highlighted for enterprises, both in terms of their participation in regulatory regimes, but also in terms of um, understanding what they needed to do to comply. We'll wrap everything up with a few conclusions, although they're not the most conclusive of conclusions, I, I uh, pre-warn you. Um, and so let's, let's get on to the, uh, the, the main meat. Um, firstly, uh, Ricardo Energy and Environment. So uh, as a business, we have a, a long track record in the energy sector, stretching right back to, uh, to 1954, as this timeline shows. Um, most important um, to, the, uh, to the work we do um, uh, in terms of the Energy Efficiency Directive is the work we do in the area of policy development and policy implementation. So towards the end of this, this timeline here that we show, picked out some key projects and key highlights from our experience. Now, you may have come across us um, over the, the course of uh, history in various different guises. And those, um, the evolution of the business and our name, our branding is shown by the, uh, the logos across the bottom, the logos and names across the bottom. Uh, we've been the same organization throughout, but we've operated in many different guises. So what we actually do now, um, we, are, we operate as part of the Ricardo uh, business, um, providing engineering and consultancy solutions worldwide. Um, within that business, we are an internationally renowned consultancy. So we provide within energy, with Ricardo Energy and Environment, um, we provide um, consultancy services only. And those consultancy services cover all of these areas on, on the diagram to your right-hand side stretching from energy and climate change, which are the main areas that we'll be focused on today, through resource efficiency, waste and recycling, air quality, chemical risk, water, and sustainable transport. Um, we have scientific and technical expertise in all of those areas. And actually, this, staff, this slide is a little out of date now, because we've got um, over 500 technical staff. The vast majority of those are based in the UK, um, but we support projects globally and are active in many markets around the world. So that's our, our pitch for us over. Um, let's move on to talk about the Energy Efficiency um, dire Directive and Article 8 itself. So a quick bit of history uh, for everybody. Um, Article, uh, so the Energy Efficiency Directive was introduced in 2012, and it's part of the, uh, the, the raft of uh, actions to achieve energy efficiency targets across Europe. Um, a num number of articles within the overall Energy Efficiency Directive, and today we're focused very much on Article 8. Uh, and Article 8 uh, sets the requirement for member states to promote and ensure the use of high-quality, cost-effective energy audits. And I'll, I'm very particular about uh, making those words clear, promote and ensure the use of high quality cost effective energy audits, because that's very important when we come back to look at the implementation and the conclusions later. 
Article 8 goes on to, uh, to mandate that uh, non-SMEs undertake cost-effective energy audits every four years, with the first deadline having been uh, the 5th of December last year, 2015. Again, we will come back to look at some of the specifics of that, that paragraph in detail later. Um, to get to the point of large enterprises, or sorry, uh, for non-SMEs, um, to, uh, to comply with these uh, requirements, member states were required to transpose the directive's provisions um, into national law by the 5th of June 2014. And again, that date becomes quite important when we look at some of our later, date, later slides. Um, Interpretations of the, the, the article vary greatly across member states, and that is what has, what has proven to be very challenging for enterprises, particularly those that, that operate in uh, multiple EU countries, or globally, actually. So um, that's setting the context around the, the challenge of uh, what the EED in Article 8 is uh, setting out, and we'll now look at um, how that has been implemented. So before we go into the, the actual implementation, um, a quick word about the study that we undertook. Um, so we undertook a study for the European Commission for the Directorate um, for Energy, um, and that study was on the energy efficient on energy efficiency in enterprises. Uh, there were four main tasks within this uh, study, um, and all of those tasks were supported by uh, a repository of information and some communications activities that were undertaken. Um, all of the, the reports, all of the information is available for, through the um, through the EU website, uh, sorry, through the EC website, um, and there's a link within this uh, presentation that takes you to the specific report that we're drawing the uh, information from today. Task one of the study looked at energy efficiency um, in small and medium-sized enterprises. Task two looked at um, energy efficiency within large enterprises. Task three looked at the quality of audits and best practice for energy audits. And task four looked at the qualification of energy auditors. All of those tasks, all of the, those activities are integral to the overall picture of energy efficiency within enterprises, but also critical to how the um, directive has been transposed and implemented um, across Europe. In undertaking the study, uh, Ricardo worked with uh, Fraunhofer and DNV, um, and the study was undertaken from March to September 2015, so during the period in which um, member states should have transposed the regulations um, and um, got in place uh, regulations for, for people to work towards. The study uh, report was issued in 2016, um, in April this year. Um, and as I've already uh, mentioned, the, the, the report that we're drawing the information from today is available um, via the link. So what did the, what did the study um, uh, show? What did we find? Um, and uh, through the experience of, of working with enterprises ourselves, what, what have we found as the key challenges arising from the regulations? Um, well, there are two main areas um, of how the regulations and how the transpositions have Im impacted on uh, enterprises. Firstly, around whether enterprises needed to comply or not, whether they needed to participate in the regulatory regimes. And there's, uh, as we go through this, the presentation, we'll see there's a number of things that bring um, ambiguity into that. The, the transposition timeline uh, for the regulations was challenging and different across Europe. The definitions of uh, what a large enterprise is, and therefore whether uh, a large enterprise needs to comply, an enterprise needs to comply or not, changed and were different. And the approach to uh, corporate groupings was also different. So that placed a challenge for organizations around whether they needed to participate or not. Having identified um, whether they needed to comply, um, then the secondary question and secondary challenge for organizations was around what they needed to do to comply. And in some situations, um, there were exemptions or alternative approaches to undertaking cost-effective audits. Um, and then a whole series of things around the scope of audits, um, the energy data and coverage, 
how to undertake an a audit of a representative sample of the business, transport energy challenges, where to get the energy auditors to undertake the work, and ultimately um, submission or supply of the uh, compliance documentation to the regulator, and the timeline for doing that. So all of those things produce challenges for, for large enterprises, and what we will now do is we will look at those um, individually and discuss them in a bit more detail. So the first key challenge for, uh, for compliance was really knowing whether uh, a company or an enterprise needed to comply at all or what they needed to comply with. Um, and what this timeline shows uh, is the key dates uh, for primary legislation that was transposed at the time of our study. Um, so this is going back to uh, the summer of 2015. So key things to note in here, and I'm going to try and use the pointer uh, for this. Key things to note on here were, uh, first of all, um, 2012, uh, December 2012, the EED enters force. Um, so throughout 2013, throughout this, this period, very little activity around um, any transposition of the regulations, even though most member states would have understood and known uh, the detail of the, e the EED and what the requirements were going to be in advance of that. Um, if we, we move on and look at the, um, at the deadline by which member states should have transposed uh, legislation, uh, primary legislation in their country of the 5th of June 2014, we can see um, that only three countries actually achieved that deadline. Um, so the challenge for enterprises in, com in complying with regulations is clear. Uh, already if there is little legislation there laid for them to understand and to comply with. Um, moving on, and actually if we, we skip right the way across, so through 2014, um, up to the point at which um, our study was concluded, and there were still a number of um, member states that had not transposed at that point in time, and, and some major countries um, Germany in particular, who had only recently transposed regulations. So again, these are, these are real challenges uh, for, for organizations in terms of understanding what to comply with and how to comply. Uh, finally, um, the thing to consider from this timeline is here is the deadline uh, for undertaking those cost-effective energy audits for organizations according to Article 8. For many organizations and for anyone involved in uh, regulations that were defined in this kind of period, you have less than one year uh, to undertake the work to achieve that deadline. Some of that um, was accounted for with changes to deadlines for uh, submission within national regulations or alternative approaches and so on. But just want to raise the, the, the point that it's a real challenge for organizations to respond within effectively less than six months um, from knowing what the regulations are to the time of compliance. Um, what this did have, the, the, the benefit of this spread of timeline um, and the transposition, is that it did start to raise awareness in organizations. So, um, uh, for example, the regulations uh, in the UK were transposed in the middle of 2014. Um, and for organizations with international activities, it started to raise their awareness of the potential for regulations in other countries. Um, so it did start to, uh, to raise awareness without it being a, a big hit on organizations straight away. But what it did do, by count, uh, the counter to that, is it increased uncertainty um, for organizations. It was unclear um, what was going on and caused, con caused confusion. Um, so people weren't clear as to whether there, was going, there were going to be regulations or when they were going to be in place and what they were going to cover. This makes it very difficult, particularly in large enterprises, um, where there is a need to engage the senior management uh, of organizations in buying into regulations and supporting the compliance process. And um, even, with, um, even with many of these transpositions um, having happened, there was still limited availability for guidance or detailed guidance. Um, and 
some of the uh, some of the regulations were still unclear, even even though the primary legislation had been laid. So some challenges to start with. So at the time of our study, um, the map on the right hand side shows where primary legislation had been um, had been passed, had been transposed. Um, and as I've already mentioned, this le led to a situation of um, ambiguity for many organizations on their need to comply. But more importantly, uh, perhaps, um, it's the, uh, the limited ability organizations had to, to implement effective um, compliance governance across those borders. So, so knowing what they had to do where and doing that in a controlled and cost-effective manner. So whilst Article 8 is seeking for cost-effective energy audits to be undertaken, um, it's introduced some um, inefficiencies in terms of cost-effectiveness of compliance with those regulations. Um, so many organizations uh, started to tackle this through a, uh, effectively a risk-based approach to, to compliance. So businesses would focus on uh, where the penalties were the greatest or where the regulations were the clearest. Um, this is not necessarily the areas where the return on the investment or the cost effectiveness of those energy audits has its greatest benefit to those business businesses. Um, and what it started to do was to um, focus attention on compliance rather than on the benefit of undertaking good quality, highly effective energy audits. So many organizations were focusing on what, they, what the minimum was they needed to do to comply with the legislation rather than what the best opportunity was for them arising from the energy audits they were undertaking. And it became a little bit of a tick box exercise um, for many organizations and became uh, a process of um, achieving that regulatory compliance and then moving on. Uh, there are, as a result, many uh, reports, uh, energy audit studies sitting on shelves currently uh, being unimplemented. Um, as of today, so bringing the, bringing the, the, the um, map up to date, regulations have now been transposed in all member states. So the, the, the whole of the map would be blue. Um, Spain transposed its uh, regulations on the 13th of February this year and Poland on the 20th of May. So clearly you can see from that straight away a challenge for large enterprises operating in those countries. Uh, it was already past the, uh, the deadline for compliance as it laid out within Article 8 itself. And clearly that's a challenge for, for organizations. What this has led to really is it, is, is it becoming a, more of a regulatory push um, rather than um, the opportunity pull from organizations. So rather than encouraging organizations to look at the, the benefit of energy efficiency, um, it has furthered the, uh, the, the need to do the minimum uh, to, uh, to comply with the, the local legislations. And we, we see that a lot with, uh, with organizations that, uh, that we have engaged with. And why is that uh, important, the, the, the timeline and the, uh, the challenges there? Well, if we would look at this slide, it um, shows you just how many companies are affected by the overall regulations um, across Europe and just how many of them are um, impacted by regulations that, uh, that were passed fairly late in the day. So this, this graph is a logarithmic sort of the left-hand side. Um, so we go from around about um, uh, 80 um, organizations, here, 80 organizations uh, in one country that, that needed to comply through to around 50,000 in Germany. Um, so that's the, 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 the logarithmic scale there. So um, what, this, what this shows you is uh, that almost half the total number of participants expected across all nations um, reside in Germany or are headquartered in Germany, so 50,000 of the 110,000 or so. But the German regulations were only transposed in, in April 2015. So that provides a fairly short turnaround time uh, for those organizations to comply by the 5th of December 2015 deadline. 
Now that was accounted for within the German transposition, and there were different uh, there were alternatives and different timelines uh, brought in there to to account for some of that. Um, but um, for uh, companies based in Germany, many of those 50,000 organisations would have subsidiaries or operations um, in neighbouring countries, and those regulations in the neighbouring countries may differ uh, quite significantly. Uh, for example, in France and in Austria, the regulations are quite different to the, to the German regulations. Um, but not only that, um, at the time of uh, German transposition, other, na other neighboring countries, such as Poland, didn't have the regulations in place. So it's really hard for organizations sitting uh, across Europe um, to know what to comply with and where. So I think I've, I've labored that point enough. Um, so we'll, we'll move on to the second challenge area now, which was uh, around whether the uh, whether the regulations apply to me as an organisation, as an enterprise, or not. And the challenge here is around the definition of what is a large enterprise. And as we pointed out earlier, Article 8 um, makes it a very clear reference to non-SMEs. And so by not being an SME, you are automatically defined as being a large enterprise. And there is the EU definition of SMEs, which is very clear and very well understood. Um, and it's very easily applied. However, when you flip that, when you look at it from the other, uh, the other end, so saying rather than being an SME, rather than um, being an SME, you are, an, uh, you are not an SME, you are a large enterprise. Some of the wording becomes difficult um, to, to transpose in that way. So, uh, for example, whether you should have both a uh, number of employees and uh, a financial criteria that define uh, your SME status, or whether it is either or that defines your uh, SME status. So, what this created, and the, the diagram on the right-hand side um, starts to, to, to bring this out, is that there are three variables around that definition of SME. Um, so the number of employees, the turnover of the business, and the balance sheet. And combining those three variables, you have um, eight potential combinations of those, uh, of those. So, for example, I shall use the pointer again. Um, you could have um, organizations that have uh, less than or equal to 43 million uh, euro of balance sheet or organizations that have greater than 43 million of uh, balance sheet. Um, and similarly with uh, turnover at greater than um, or uh, less than or equal to 50 million of turnover on this axis and then employee numbers across the bottom here. So fewer than 250 employees or greater than or equal to. 350 employees. Combining those, as we say, we get um, eight potential um, combinations, three of which um, would define you as being an SME in the bottom here, and uh, five of them would define you as being, by default, a non-SME and therefore um, a large enterprise. Um, but the way in which that um, reversing of the SME definition was implemented in national legislation was not consistent uh, across Europe. And so that leads to a number of different situations whereby member states have differing interpretations and um, uh, an entity, a company that may have to comply in one country may not have to comply in another country and vice versa. So again, really challenging and particularly challenging for those enterprises that have cross-border activities and so on. To highlight that challenge, um, this table, and I don't expect you to be able to read all of the detail on this table because there's quite a, quite a lot in there. Um, but, it, but it shows you the extent uh, of the differences and the different interpretations. So any data in uh, red text shows where um, the interpretation in the national legislation differs uh, from the strict interpretation um, and the strict reversing of the, the SME guidance. Um, so in some situations, again, 
the pointer. Um, in some situations, we have um, differences around the number of employees. Um, so in there, so the, in these ones, it is um, greater than uh, 250 rather than greater than or equal to. And that's a minor point, but it's, uh, it's quite important. Um, in here, we have some countries whereby um, you are, to, to be a large enterprise, you were required to have both uh, an employee, a minimum employee number, and meet the financial criteria, um, so particularly here in Spain and Sweden. Um, and then moving across to those actual financial criteria, we have some differences in terms of the actual the, the turnover level. So in Croatia, for example, it's a 34 million rather than the standard 50 million. Um, and then in terms of balance sheet, sometimes lower levels, so 17 million, uh, 17 and a half down here for Slovenia. So some challenges. Um, and those, those differences, again, make it difficult for, for organizations from a, from a corporate um, governance perspective. Um, we'll come to look at how the, these criteria are applied shortly, so what legal entities they are applied to. But it's also worth noting before we, we move on to that, that um, some member states, in addition to these minimum criteria, also included um, additional requirements. And those um, additional requirements may have um, established energy consumption thresholds or, or other additional criteria uh, based on sites um, rather than the overall enterprise. Now, on some occasions, um, those energy consumption criteria would lead to a situation where enterprises could be excluded from the regulation because whilst they were um, whilst they were large enterprises in terms of their employees and their uh, their turnover, they were not large in terms of their energy consumption. But on uh, other occasions, it may mean that um, SMEs. Um, so organizations with um, a relatively few employees and a low turnover or balance sheet uh, might be drawn into the regulations based on their energy consumption. So those two different um, the factors there, those two different considerations, mean that you could have a situation where um, an SME is required to undertake a, uh, an energy audit by the regulations, uh, but that energy audit would quite probably be cost effective for them given their large energy consumption. By reverse, a uh, large enterprise with relatively small operations um, and relatively small energy consumption uh, may, be, um, may be required to undertake an energy audit um, that isn't cost effective for them. Okay, so that's the that, that's the criteria um, that led to enterprises needing to participate. Um, and the, the next area of challenge for enterprises is around how those criteria are subsequently applied to the legal entity and, and, and what organizations, what, what defines the enterprise. Now, the Energy Efficiency Directive very clearly stipulates that the non-SME criteria um, should be applied at a company's global group operations. So this is uh, entirely in line with the EU definition for SMEs uh, and brings into play um, things like partner and linked enterprises and so on. But many of the member states have interpreted that in, in different ways and have reflected the complexity of actually regulating uh, this uh, and regulating corporate groups. Um, so if we were to consider, for example, this, uh, this example organization here, um, ABC PLC, um, we find that um, in Germany, um, in the middle, um, even though the, uh, the enterprise, the activities they have in Germany constitute only 20 employees, and we will assume a relatively low turnover and balance sheet as well, um, they are required to comply with the regulations because of the global entity, because of the, the wider organization. And that's because the German regulations um, distinctly link to the, uh, the global group operations. In France, however, um, only the operations B needed to comply um, with the regulations, even though they, they're a subsidiary of um, entity A. Um, and that's because 
um, the way in which the regulations were drafted there link it to individual company registrations. Um, so it is only the, uh, the employees and the financial criteria for France B that would be considered against the criteria rather than all of the operations within France. So we start to see some of the challenges here for, for, for organizations where there is a significant difference in terms of whether the uh, regulations apply or not. Um, and moving across, you can, you can see that quite starkly with, uh, in Italy where the, uh, both of the legal entities there are needed to comply even though one of them was significantly below the 250 employees threshold. Um, and in the UK, none of these organizations needed to comply with, with the ESOS regulations. Um, so uh, we've already, I've already mentioned a number of times about the, the uh, confusion um, that this inconsistency causes. But it's also worth thinking about whether this is leading to a situation where the energy audits being undertaken or being proposed are going to be cost effective. Um, it is quite likely that for France B and their 300 employees um, that energy audits could be cost effective and, could, and implementing energy savings could be cost effective. It is less likely that for Germany C uh, as a, an entity that those energy audits will be as cost effective if delivered to the same, uh, to the same level. So those were the, 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 the challenges around whether uh, organizations needed to comply or whether the, the regulations applied. And then we start to move on to look at um, what an organization needs to do to comply. And uh, there are multiple um, uh, ways and approaches to doing this. And we'll, we'll look at each of those as we go through now. But straddling the two, do I need to and how do I comply questions. Um, there are these things around exemptions and alternative approaches. So whilst the whilst Article 8 is driving um, energy audits, it did provide for alternative um, measures um, and for, in some cases, for more simple audits to be undertaken rather than um, full energy audits. One of the alternative approaches is to have a, a, an energy management system in place that's accredited to a, a recognized international standard. But again, there was differences in, in national legislation as to what was accepted and what was stipulated as being uh, a, a relevant or appropriate international standard. Um, and you can see from, uh, although you can't uh, see very well on the diagram today, uh, but the diagram in the bottom left-hand side of this slide shows the, um, uh, the cycle for uh, ISO 50001, the energy management standard. Um, and that, sh that clearly shows uh, that energy audits are a fundamental part of the process. So it's quite right and it seems quite sensible um, that if you have uh, an energy management system in place that is accredited to this uh, standard, then it would seem appropriate as an alternative way of complying uh, with the need to undertake energy audits because you already have a management process in place that's doing those. Um, some, uh, in, in some countries, um, uh, engagement in voluntary schemes also provided uh, an alternative approach to, um, to compliance. So a good example here would be in the Netherlands, the long-term agreements um, scheme and participation in that meant that you didn't have to comply with the new legislation that, that effectively overlaid it. Um, on the right-hand side of the screen here, um, and in the interest of time, I won't go into great detail here, um, but this outlines some of the other uh, countries where there are uh, exclusions based on energy consumption. Um, and I'll particularly pick up on Sweden uh, in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, whereby small uh, operations of uh, overseas organizations, so overseas to Sweden, um, that had relatively low energy consumption were, were, uh, were and are not required to, to undertake the uh, energy audits. However, they are required to make some notification of, um, uh, of their status and, and uh, exempt themselves in that way. So that, that outlines whether organizations um, then needed to comply. Um, so we then start to look at, OK, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a large enterprise. The regulations apply to me. I've, I've done that. I can't exempt, exempt myself based on any of the operations. What do I need to do to comply? 
And um, Article 8, again, is very clear in terms of setting out the, uh, the parameters. So it says that the, that the energy audit should cover all buildings, industrial processes, and transport energy. Um, well, this instantly leads to um, uh, a challenge. And any energy professional on the line will, uh, will know that um, data is not always readily available uh, to do energy studies and energy audits and so on. And the larger the enterprise, um, quite often, the larger the challenge in gathering that data as you have more sites, um, more facilities, more operations to, to worry about. Um, and more requirements for gathering that, that data in the, uh, from, from different hosts and different organizations. Um, so in doing that, and, and, and the, through the national um, uh, transpositions of the, the regulations, different criteria and different scopes of, uh, of audit were applied. Um, so again, we have a challenge in terms of actually gathering that data uh, in the first place, and again, particularly picking up on the points here, where organizations have large property portfolios or um, fleets of vehicles, um, or where they have a large number of rented um, offices where they don't normally see energy data, um, uh, through to, to transport data. So there's a real, kind of a, 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 a real challenge in there in terms of gathering that data in the first place. Now, this, the picture in the bottom right-hand side shows a, um, a, a delivery truck hurtling along the, uh, uh, the, the highway, um, probably bringing us our Christmas presents. Let's, let's hope so, anyway. And, um, but it highlights a key, um, a key challenge for large enterprises. Um, who owns and operates that vehicle? Who is responsible for the fuel, for the energy used in operating that vehicle? Um, it's under different legislation, legislative regimes in different countries. Um, the ownership and responsibility sits with different organizations. And then where is that transport being undertaken? Um, so within the, for example, the UK regulations, it, um, uh, uh, the UK entity would be uh, required to rep uh, report the energy consumption where the travel was undertaken within the UK. But once that truck leaves the UK, it's still being operated. It's still being fueled by the same legal entity um, based in the UK. But the energy consumption is now overseas, and so it no longer needs to include that energy data. Um, that's specific to, uh, to trucks. Um, if, it were a, if it were an aircraft, it, the, the situation would be different. So again, challenges in terms of understanding the detail and differences in the way in which the, uh, the legislation was applied across different countries. Um, looking then at the, the detail of how those audits uh, were to be undertaken. So we've identified what an audit needs to, under, uh, needs to include in terms of buildings, process, and uh, transport energy. But what's the detail in terms of what needs to be done and what constitutes a, 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 an appropriate audit? Most transpositions refer to um, the energy auditing standard, so EN 16247. Um, but in some cases, there was, there was no defined uh, requirement. Um, mostly, um, where there was no defined requirement, those, the, the, the legislation there would refer to approved energy auditors. Um, in fact, in, in most, uh, most transpositions, transpositions um, uh, the work needed to be undertaken by um, approved energy auditors. Again, this, thinking back to our timeline, it's a real challenge to get in place um, enough uh, accredited and approved energy auditors um, in a short time frame to, uh, to meet the deadlines. Other areas where there were, there were differences and challenges in the, um, the auditing approaches were around the uh, de minimis threshold, so the, the amount of uh, energy consumption that could be excluded from the audit because of it not being cost effective to, to, to look at. So a huge range in here from 0% um, in the Netherlands, so all energy must be included within the audit through 10% exclusion or de minimis um, in the UK, up to 35% uh, in France, uh, depending on when you, uh, when you complied. So there was incentive in France 
uh, for organisations to seek compliance early, um, and, but be able to do so based on a, a smaller fraction of their total energy consumption. Um, then the, the, the final area of auditing approaches um, to, to consider was whether you had to audit all of the um, enterprise's operations or whether you could um, undertake uh, a single audit um, of a single facility and extrapolate the findings um, as being appropriate to other facilities. So for example, if you were a retail organization with one, uh, 100 similar retail outlets, could you um, audit one or two or, uh, of those retail facilities and then um, extrapolate the findings to cover all 100 um, retail organizations? Some, uh, some national legislation have very clear and specific guidance um, on this. Um, so, for example, in, in France, um, it links to uh, above a certain threshold of number of sites, then it links to the square root of those number of sites. So it's very clear that you have to undertake eight or 12 audits and so on. Um, and uh, the next thing we'll look at here in Italy, um, again, a very specific guidance in terms of sampling. Um, and this quite sensibly links back to um, energy consumption. So based on a number of sites and an energy consumption threshold, um, then there's guidance here as to how much um, uh, of, the, of the total energy needs to be covered within the, the, the sampling. Um, in the UK, uh, the requirement was just for it to be a representative sample, um, and you can interpret representative how you, however you wish, um, but um, your auditor, your approved auditor, must approve and agree with the, uh, the interpretation of what is, what is representative and, and what isn't. So <laughs> having talked about the energy auditors, um, uh, most of the legislation required the audits to be undertaken uh, by external um, auditors um, who were approved by some kind of some national body uh, to a certain standard. In some cases, um, internal auditors could be used, but generally they still needed to be um, approved to a certain standard. Um, or where they where they weren't, um, then you might need some kind of additional internal sign off of the, the findings of the work. Um, it is not something that should ever be underestimated how long and how complex it is to um, develop a network and a, um, a body of approved and accredited auditors to undertake this work. Um, I don't know how many auditors were approved in Germany, uh, or rather how many auditors have been approved in Germany, but I would imagine you need a fair few auditors um, to be able uh, to service the 50,000 organizations um, that needed to comply. Um, and that information um, around uh, numbers of auditors and who um, uh, who's a regulating body or who's a, a certification body um, and where to get information varied again by country. So once again, if you're a large enterprise operating in multiple countries, you couldn't necessarily use a single auditor to operate all of your facilities across all countries, because that auditor would need to be um, uh, registered on each national registry. Um, you, might, you might find somebody in one country that you want to work with, um, and you might have um, good relationships already with an energy um, consultant or energy supplier um, in, in one country. But you wouldn't necessarily be able to um, engage with the list of uh, accredited auditors in every country to quickly identify somebody that would be appropriate for you. So again, lots of time spent for organizations trying to find the right solution for them. Still got a fair few more slides. I'm just going to speed up a little bit in the interest of time. Um, we're getting towards the end now, so assuming that enterprises had been through the process of um, confirming they needed to comply, um, identifying what it is they needed to do, and undertaking it, the final step of the process is around notifying compliance. So ensuring that the, the regulator knows that you are compliant, and ensuring that uh, they they don't come knocking, wanting to uh, to fine you for non-compliance. Um, the requirements in, in different countries well are, are really quite um, stark and significant. Um, so in Ireland, um, 
companies are not required to do anything to notify the regulator. They simply have to have the information available for audit if they are inspected by the regulator. Um, in the UK, and the uh, screenshot on the right-hand side here is from the, uh, the UK scheme, ESOS, from the registry there. Every company, um, every participant uh, was required to fill in a, a questionnaire, uh, which uh, ran to about 50 questions in total, uh, gathering information about the organization and the coverage um, of the audits and so on, uh, highlighting who their um, auditor was, and so on and so forth. But interestingly, um, uh, that even though that gathers quite a lot of information, it did not gather any information on the, the enterprise's energy consumption or the findings and outcomes of the energy audits that were undertaken. So if the, if the regulations are around driving an improvement in uptake of energy audits and implementing energy efficiencies, the regulatory regime here did not put that at the forefront uh, of organizations' mind it put at the forefront of their mind that they had complied. Finally on that, the, uh, the, the, the deadlines. And we, again, we come back to, uh, to the timeline we had uh, earlier. With, with such a range of transpositions of primary legislation and uh, in many cases as well, um, differences and, and, and an extended timeline for detailed guidance and compliance information. There is a range of um, when the compliance deadline was, was imposed across different countries, and that's outlined here. Um, Austria, interestingly, was uh, uh, ahead of the EED uh, regulation requirement, so they needed to comply by the 30th of November last year, so very nearly a year ago. So the very final point that I, that I want to raise around challenges for organizations then links back to the, the way in which EED and Article 8 related regulations interact with other existing uh, schemes and regulatory regimes in, in country. Um, so I won't go into the detail here. You can, you can read it at a, at a later date, a later point in time. Um, but the, the scope of audits, the scope of the regulations, the, the, the energy consumption are covered um, very significantly between different regimes. Um, and where uh, a member state already had voluntary schemes in place or other mechanisms in place, um, sometimes the EED regulations introduced inconsistencies between those. And so rather than uh, supporting an engaged audience that was already doing uh, things around energy efficiency, it actually started to implement or, or put barriers and, and challenge into the process um, because it, there was now complexity and ambiguity as to what was voluntary and, uh, uh, and what was part of the, the regulatory regime. Um, so in conclusion, um, and again, I'll, the, the link at the bottom of this slide takes you to the, uh, the full report um, that we produced from, from the study. Um, there, there was a, a generally a, a requirement for organizations to, uh, to undertake compliance and to, to do that at the group level, um, but that was not consistent across, uh, across Europe. Um, and the challenges that we've run through uh, were particularly felt by organizations that had multi uh, operations in multiple EU um, uh, member states, uh, where there was a complex uh, legal structure, um, uh, particularly if uh, components of that legal structure would, would qualify as an SME in their own right. Um, organizations that had large property portfolios, and again, particularly if those properties were, uh, were occupied as tenants. and um, a challenging area for everybody around uh, transport fuel, um, uh, where organizations, I think I, I managed to miss this point earlier, where organizations um, were not transport specialist companies, there was a real challenge in terms of understanding their transport energy data as part of the overall picture of the energy consumption of the organization. And at that point, um, I. I conclude um, my presentation and open the floor to, um, to questions from you. I have overrun, so hopefully we've still got some time, though, for questions.